the pastors confronted me and they said, so who are you? Who are you really? And I said, well, I'm a man who used to be a woman. And their response to me was, okay, um, you know, we love you. We love you. We just can't have you coming back here. I was probably about three in there and I, it was a summer day and we had, we, I grew up in a tiny house with a big yard and I was running around without my shirt on because by then I knew I already wanted to be a boy. So I was already acting out. My shoe had come untied. And so I went up to my mom and I asked her, will you please tie my shoe? And she's like, well, I won't until you put your shirt on. And then I'm like, Okay, so I just took my shoes off and ran around because I didn't want to put my shirt on because then that would make me a girl. I didn't realize that then. It was after later that I figured out that that's what I was doing. The second memory um, is before kindergarten. So it was about four or five. I, um, I was riding my trike my tricycle, we had a driveway and I'd ride it up and down the driveway and I had its own little parking spot like you would for your car. And I can remember riding my tricycle up and down the driveway and pulling into different places um, on the driveway, like pretending I was gonna pick up my girlfriend and we were gonna go get married. And it was at that point that I began to realize that this probably isn't normal. You know, when I think back about the memories, I don't really have any feelings attached to them. Um, a lot of my childhood, there's not a lot of um, feelings attached to things unless they're really traumatic and painful. And there's been healing in those. However, um, I, I was just so detached emotionally that I didn't know how to feel about certain things uh, that happened. I viewed my dad, you know, he emotionally uh, was abusive to my mom as well as verbally. I did see my dad hit my mom. It was only like twice. I know that's twice too many, but um, as far as you know, physical abuse, there wasn't really anything. My dad uh, was a very jealous man, very insecure. I realize now he's very narcissistic. So it was pretty much all about him. But in the verbal abuse and in the emotional abuse, uh, I watched my mom crumble underneath that. And the way my dad did these things, my little mind came to the conclusions that women are hated, women are vulnerable, and women are weak. And that's why he was picking on my mom, basically. And then when I watched my mom respond out of these things, I saw that she, you know, she was weak because she didn't know how to stand up for herself. She didn't know how to draw those boundaries because she was afraid of him. You know, he, he could be angry in a moment. And, um, and I watched her be vulnerable in that as he continued to charge at her with words and those types of abuses. And I don't, she acted like she was hated. <laughs> and so when I looked at all of that, I'm like, okay, so I'm like my mom and my dad's this way and my mom's that way. And I don't want to be hated. You know, I don't want to be weak. I don't want to be vulnerable. So what else do I have? <laughs> but to become a man. When I was seven, my little brother was born and he was celebrated tremendously, you know, and whatever affection I had from my dad was now all turned to my little brother. So there was another lie that crept in there that I could be replaced. Boys are celebrated, women are replaced. And so that really affirmed in order to get that affection, I had to be a boy, to be affirmed, to be okay, to be celebrated, to be good enough. Um, or just to be enough. When I was 11, I have an older half-brother, and he began to molest me. And even though I felt that it was wrong, you know, I had that lie in there, women are weak and women are vulnerable. So he was taking advantage of me, believing I was weak and vulnerable, not knowing how to stand up to him, and also knowing that if I told my dad, my dad would probably beat the living stuff out of him. My mom would probably deny it as she did with anything else when confronted. She would be like, no, your dad's okay. The way he's treating me is okay. And so I grew up in this really unhealthy atmosphere. I was probably molested by my older brother until I was like 13. 
And I don't know why he stopped. I was just glad that he did. <laughs> and I don't know if I got to a certain age where I was no longer appealing to him or what. But those are the things that the Lord has shown me that, you know, stirred all in there. And then those lies were affirmed along the way, too, as far as um, when um, my parents had a rental house and one of the families that moved in there, I can remember the woman. So my mom would always make friends with the wife that was, you know, of the couple. And I can remember her saying to my mom, you know, she would be such a cute little boy. I was like, yeah. Yeah. So that totally affirmed, you know, all those things that, yeah, it would be a better to be a boy. People are recognizing that I'm already cute as a boy, so I might as well be that. And being a woman isn't really a great option. Um, just was not a great option. Denise Schick, the founder and executive director of Help for Families, has written Transgender Confusion, a biblical-based Q&A for families. In this book, Schick explores a variety of topics including science and feelings, family questions and answers, answering theological questions, walking in truth, and Christianity and culture. This is an invaluable resource for families with transgender confusion in their midst. To get your copy of Transgender Confusion, go to www.helpforfamilies.com. David Kyle Foster describes from Scripture the sanctification process in his book, Transformed into His Image, Hidden Steps on the Journey to Christ's Likeness, borrowing key insights from leaders like Leanne Payne, Larry Crabb, and Benedict Rochelle. This book calls the Christian deeper into the life that God created us to have and shows God's provision for making it possible. Download your copy of Transformed into His Image today wherever ebooks are sold or get the paperback version at our online store at www.purepassion.us. When I was 16, I got a car and uh, I had met a girl at one of those dances I was at. And so she became my girlfriend and I would go out and pick her up and we'd go out on dates. And I was totally lying to my parents where I was going. Eventually that caught up with me because this mom was kind of putting it together and um, she called my parents and then my parents confronted me. That was when I told them I wanted to be a man. And my dad pretty much told me, we will not talk about this again. You are not going to do that. And at one point I was alone with my mom and I said to my mom, mom, you know what? I, I really do want to be a boy. And my mom said, that's gross. And I was like, all right, so my secret will continue. Even though the girl knew about me, she still viewed me as her boyfriend. So we kind of went off and on there for a little while. And then when I became 19, I got out of the house. I started doing my research to find out who would help me. I went to a doctor and he's like, yeah, I can start you on hormones. So I moved out of the house and uh, I began the hormones and I thought I was free. I was like, yeah, I'm finally here. I have arrived. I am free. This is, this is my life. I saw myself as a heterosexual male, and to date women as a male was normal. It, I never viewed myself really as a woman, per se, other than that was the part that I hated. That was the part that was I was constantly pushing down and um, being detached from as far as any identity, sexual identity as a woman or gender or anything. I totally wanted to be male. One of the things that the Lord revealed was that I, because my mom wasn't nurturing, there's this nurture thing that I was missing. And I believe that's why I thought wanting to be with women was, was normal because a lot of the women that I would choose would be very nurturing, very gentle, very soft, ones that needed to be protected. Because one of the vows that I made is that I'm gonna be the man my dad is not. I'm not gonna be an abuser. I'm not gonna be those things that he is. So I took the hormones, um, of course, right away, uh, I started filling out muscularly. I started getting acne and um, started to grow a beard. And I think from, so I started at the age of 19. And I think from 19 forward, I don't think I was ever without a mustache once I was able to grow one. It was part of my identity. And then I continued to work out on top of that. So I got pretty buffed and then taking the hormones. And then I was taking a extra little bit more to make sure that I could keep up this physique uh, when I worked out. Because my goal was not to ever be known as a woman. My goal was to only be known as a man. And I couldn't figure out, because I had met some other transsexual people 
and they were all about being known. And I'm like, I no, I don't, I don't want to sit around in a groove and talk about being a transgender person. I just want to go and live a normal life. This life as a man, normally. <laughs> that was my whole goal. And so in continuing to work out, I realized later that that was my form of protection. The harder I worked out, the less weak I felt. I felt, you know, there's a whole safety issue in that. You know, as I viewed my mom, I'm like, you were never very safe. And so I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be tough so that no one, no one can take advantage of me. I won't be weak and I can protect the women that need protection. I was very cautious um, when I dressed and undressed. I usually tried to go to the gym uh, already in my gym clothes. And if not, then I would use a stall. I would change that way. Um, or if I knew there was a place where nobody really used the locker room right there, I would change there and I would do it as quickly as I could. In wearing man's clothing, um, that just affirmed who I was. It, on the, it was my outer appearance that affirmed what I felt in my heart. And I didn't, there was no sexual experience that I, no gratification or any things like that. That was just to keep my identity safe. I did think of operations. In fact, um, I did have a mastectomy. And, um, but as far as below that, I, it, it was very expensive at that time. I went as far as going through the interviews for it and to see if I was a good candidate. And I was, but then again, it was the money and financially I was just not in a place to continue that. So my spiritual journey, I was raised Lutheran. So at that point, um, if I can put it this way, it felt very dead. There was a point in my life where I was a God stalker. I knew everything about God, but I didn't know him. And then um, in high school, there was a Christian movement that I got involved in and I accepted the Lord, but I, you know, I don't know if I was for real in that when I was in high school. Uh, it was a very emotional experience, but nothing heart changing in that. And it was interesting because I accepted him when I was living that double life in high school. And then when I moved out and began to live as a man, I lived with a Chinese family and she had two daughters. One was 14 and one was 12. And I went to their youth group and it was in going to that church that I asked the Lord to be my savior. And the next morning when I woke up, I'm like, oh, well, you didn't strike me dead. You must be okay with the way I'm living. But there was something inside of me that thought I, I didn't do it right. <laughs> so the next service I went down again, accepted the Lord and, Nothing really seemed different. And so then I went down a third time and accepted the Lord. And I'm like, well, this must be good because, you know, I'm not dead. He hasn't, you know, I didn't feel any conviction as far as how I was living. So I continued on to pursue the Lord. There was a church who heard about me. My dad had found out where I was working and he went in and talked to my employer and said, you know, this guy's not a guy. It's actually my daughter and da, 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 da. Well, as he's explaining this to my employer, a person that I went to church with also worked there and she heard the entire thing, took it to the pastors. The pastors confronted me and they said, so who are you? Who are you really? And, uh, and I said, well, I'm a man who used to be a woman. And their response to me was, okay, um, you know, we love you. We love you. We just can't have you coming back here. So I left that church. Somehow though, I knew that wasn't the heart of God and uh, I hadn't lost hope. I guess I expected their response. There was kind of this expectation that I wouldn't be welcomed. And I don't know if that came because I knew my parents wouldn't be accepting of that. I always, I always anticipated rejection. So I'd always be prepared. <laughs> After that happened, I learned how to look two steps or actually four steps forward to make sure all my bases were covered and two steps back to make sure nothing was revealed back there. So I got really good at being deceptive and I didn't think of it as being deceptive. I thought more as being protective and making sure that my life was safe because, you know, I, I had seen a, a couple of movies where transgender people had gotten beaten up and one of them got killed. And I was like, so that made me even more intentional as far as keeping myself together and not letting anybody know and not ever being caught. And, you know, and I, it's amazing though, cause I do see little points of the Lord in there working on my behalf. Um, I was at a bar and I'd been drinking and you know, when you drink, eventually you have to go use the facilities. 
And I can remember going into the bathroom the first time and all there was was the urinal and the stall and the stall had no door. And I'm like, oh man, this is not a good situation for me. But I couldn't use the women's because I look like this beefy guy now. So I'm like, all right, I need some help here. And so I went in there and nobody was in the bathroom. I mean, this was a very busy bar. So I went in, used the bathroom, and I had just walked out of the stall and three guys walked in. And so in my mind, I'm like, thank you, Lord. You know, there's little pockets like that where I felt like I got protection from the Lord because I don't know how else that happened. I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> and I, I know that there was times where he, you know, took care of me. Uh, I'm not saying that he agreed with my life, but I think as a parent, you know, all parents, even if you don't agree with your child, there's a certain amount of protective thing that you have inside you that you want to help them through that rough time. After I got kicked out of the church, I can I continued um, and I found a new job. And in that job, I met another girl. We got together because, you know, we just spent so much time and we were talking. And there, I think there was a certain amount of attraction to begin with. She was a Christian and I can remember coming over to her house and she always had her Bible open. And so I asked her, I said, how much do you read the Bible? And she said to me, as much as I can. And I thought, what? What is that? Who wants to read their Bible as much as they can? And I thought, huh, maybe I should be doing that. So we were together probably for about three years. And um, probably in the first six months, I confided in her. I'm like, hey, I know this is what you see, but this is what you're getting. <laughs> and I just, and she was like, that's okay. I'm okay with that. So we were together for three years and um, I went to the church with her that she was going to, and I really liked it. So I was continuing to pursue the Lord um, or what I thought was pursuing the Lord, but I think it was just still God stalking, trying to figure out who is this God and what does he mean? And when this happens, what happens here? And, you know, I hear this in the Bible, what does that mean? So there was a bunch of questions that I had. And then when her and I broke up, I stayed at that church. At that time, the Lord brought along a spiritual, some spiritual parents, a mom and dad, the spiritual father. He, I didn't know this at the time, but he was actually bringing healing as far as just being a dad and just loving on me. Though I know I was deceiving him in it, um, I I could, he was somebody that I could call and say, hey, I'm wondering this about the Lord. What does that mean? So I was able to begin to ask questions about that. And after I broke up with her, I immediately got into another relationship with a woman. I was on the rebound. And uh, after about a year of dating her, we were fighting a lot. And I woke up one morning and I realized, oh my gosh, she's my mom and I'm my dad. And I'm like, I'm abusing her just like my dad did. Maybe not to the same degree, but it was close enough to realize I can't be doing this to her. I, I have become everything that I vowed I would not be. So we broke up and in doing so, um, I got more involved in the church and become even more hungry for the Lord. I began to uh, be involved in the junior high ministry. I love junior high kids. I, you know, that hasn't changed. <laughs> Whether I lived as a man or now, you know, as who God created me to be, I still love junior high kids. So I think there's something wired in there for them. Um, and then I was leading a men's small group. I was also in the orchestra. And then I was part of kind of a leadership for college age kids. And then I was also part of the older single adults. And that's where the men's Bible study was at, was with that group. So I was involved with a lot. I was known... Um, pretty much a lot in the church. As I continued, I did meet this girl that I was like, wow, I really like you. I was really falling hard for her. I hadn't told her anything yet. And uh, I got her involved in the junior high ministry. There was a retreat, uh, it was a winter retreat, and she was a skier, so I invited her and she helped out in the kitchen. It was at that retreat that I realized, you know what? I, I think I love this girl. I really love this girl. And we came back from the retreat and it was a Sunday afternoon and we had time enough to go to evening church. I was dead tired. I didn't want to go, but she wanted to. So I went, my spiritual dad came up to me and he said, Hey, uh, do you got a moment? Can I talk to you about something? I thought, 
you know what, I know this feeling of, can I talk to you about something? And I thought, I think I'm going to be confronted. We went back into this prayer room and one of the pastors that I, you know, we'd become friends. He, he was pastor of the single, uh, the college age group. And I was like, oh yeah, here we go. He's sitting there waiting for me. My, my spiritual dad brings me back here. I'm just like, all right, here we go. I'm going to be confronted. Sure enough. And, and the pastor looked at me and he said, uh, I just got a question for you. Who, well, he said, you know, we're hearing some rumors about you and I just want to know who are you? Who are you really? Same question, you know, 11 years earlier. And I'm like, oh wow. But this time for whatever reason, I told the truth. And I said, prior to that, I'd said, I'm a man who used to be a woman. This time I said, I'm a woman living as a man. That's, you know, that's the truth. And when I did that, the Holy Spirit went and just blew into me. And I was like, Ooh, and you know, I, I didn't know much about the prophetic or anything, but I had this quick vision and I saw two weeks of my life and everything I needed to do. And I needed to step down from this ministry. And first and foremost, though, I had to go back to being who God created me to be. And I was like, Ugh. to me, there was no other option. I had no other choice. There was no plan B. There was not, maybe I could live as a eunuch. Maybe I could, you know, not date. There was just, those options were not there. That was plan A. This is a time when we all need the advice and help we can get to minister not only to those with homosexual confusion, but to the transgendered person as well. Denise Schick grew up with a father who was transgendered. The lessons she learned in that crucible have informed more than a decade of ministry, as well as a new book called Understanding Gender Confusion, a faith-based perspective. In this book, Denise shares great wisdom on subjects ranging from cross-dressing to sex change regret. To get your copy of Understanding Gender Confusion, go to www.helpforfamilies.com. Restored Hope Network is a coalition of ministries serving those who desire to overcome sinful relational and sexual issues in their lives and those impacted by such behavior, particularly homosexuality. RHN connects those seeking help with local member ministries and other resources. Even as the culture embraces distorted expressions of gender, sexuality, and relationships, RHN affirms God's unchanging hope and truth that Jesus Christ transforms the lives of all who seek Him. Visit RestoredHopeNetwork.org. That's one of the questions I've had from the Lord is, Lord, how did you do that? Because I was dead set. I mean, everything about my life said, I'm a man. How did you change my thinking? How did you do that? Because when he blew into me, I was like, oh yeah, I, I got to do this. I, I have to go do this. And I'm thinking, I got to step down from this ministry. I got to step down from this ministry. I got to step down from this ministry. Oh, and I got to go out and break up with my girlfriend. You know, and as I look back on that, I'm like, why would I do, I love this girl. You know, I'm thinking she's the one, I'm gonna marry her, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I gotta go and break up with this girl. Like it was just matter of a fact. And when I asked the pastor, I said, so what do you think I should do? You know, I hadn't shared anything with him that it just happened. He's like, hmm, I don't know. I, I don't know, I've never dealt with this. And I said, well, um, I think I know. And he's like, okay, great, what should we do? And I said, well, um, I believe I need to go back to living as a woman. And he's like, okay, all right. And I said, and I feel like this plan has been laid out. And so I need to go and I need to step down from this. And I need to go and talk to the, the pastor over the worship or over the orchestra. And I need to, you know, do this and I need to do this. And I was working with him and I said, and I need to step down from what I'm doing with you. And and oh, I need to go and break up with my girlfriend. And he's like, all right, let's do this. And he said, how about we meet for the next two weeks and let's get everything in motion. I'll set up the meetings with the pastors that you need to talk to and we'll do this. And I thought that was interesting Then he said the next two weeks because that's what the Lord had showed me. And I never told him that. I just told him, I think this is the things that I need to do this, need to do this. And I never said it was over a two week period, but he goes, okay, in the next couple of weeks, let's put this in motion and let's get you moving forward. And I was like, all right, I'm in. 
I don't know how that happened. I just knew. And I think because the Lord, when I broke up with that, that girl that I realized was my mom, there was probably a couple of years in there. And I can remember I was driving to um, orchestra practice and I'm driving along and the Lord said to me, will you now, will you now? And it, he wasn't angry, but he was intentional with his question. So I'm taking this inventory. I don't got a girlfriend. Kind of, kind of do. I want more church. I want to know the Lord. I'm thinking I ain't got no reason not to. And I'm like, yes, Lord, I will. And you know, and at that point when I was dating the woman that was like my mom, I had gotten st steeped in addiction to pornography. I was like, I couldn't go a day without seeing it. And it was a bad addiction. And I would try to talk about it, but there would just be so much shame. And I would say, yeah, you know what? I watched pornography today and they're like, oh, you know, yeah, wow, that's a bummer. And you know, but they didn't understand that I watched the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. And I already had plans to watch it tomorrow. <laughs> so it, it was bad. And when I said yes to the Lord, it was about three months later that I realized, hey, wait, I haven't watched pornography and I haven't wanted to. So when I said yes to the Lord, yes, Lord, I will, he broke that. And I didn't know he had broken that. I mean, I, there was no, you know, thunder and lightning and I didn't feel any different. I just drove on to orchestra practice and, <laughs> you know, and then I, that was, I was freed from that. From that point, there was probably a, maybe a four year period where the Lord continued to just woo me bringing healing. Um, and it just so happened that the pastor at the church, um, different pastor, head pastor, did a teaching on um, dad, you know, the Lord being our dad. What does that look like as the Lord being our dad? Not just being father, but being our dad. And I can remember just, you know, wanting to lay down and cry like a baby during those services because of what I, what I understood the Lord's heart for me or what I thought I could understand. Cause it was, it was just so much and so overwhelming. And he is touching this really deep place of pain with my dad. And then having the, my spiritual dad come along and affirm that, yeah, you know, God does feel this way about you. He does say these things about you. And, and so here I have my spiritual dad and God, you know, both of them kind of wooing me to the Lord, you know, and he just continued to woo me. And I, I was just so hungry for him. And I can remember I started reading my Bible every day, you know, thinking, man, I get why she wanted to read her Bible. There's good stuff in here. And I can remember being so happy about my Bible. I would carry it into work, you know, and I'd have it on my desk. And people are like, man, what's wrong with you? You're carrying this Bible thing. And I'm like, yeah, I love it. Let me, let me tell you about what I read.